Uh, an African point of view on the evolution of wealth, because uh, if you look at textbooks or documentaries, you will always have the American point of view, because most researchers on the evolution of wealth are American, so they give you their American point of view on that. So it's just to, uh, to explore uh, what, what is the African fossil record of wealth and how relevant it is scientifically. So in, Af in Africa, we have two hotspots of fossil waves, places where we find a lot of fossil waves. One of them is Wadi al Haytham in uh, Egypt, so the Valley of Wales. And you can see this is not a lie, uh, this is an actual picture of the, the, the place. Uh, you do find waves all over the place, uh, skeletons that are about 30, 40 million years old. And there is South Africa, so the South African coast also gives off a lot of fossil whales. Uh, it's just that the fossils are offshore. Most of them are offshore. So they are dragged by the nets of the, 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 of the fishermen. They drag those fossil whales, or they are sometimes just rejected on the beach by uh, storms. But there is a lot of fossils uh, that come from the, the, the seas in South Africa. They are about five to 10 million years old. So here you have a few examples. Uh, of big waves on the uh, on the left side of the screen, maybe I can use that. Yeah. <laughs> so big waves fossils that were discovered here in South Africa. In that paper, that particular paper in 2008, they named about a dozen new species, uh, just all at once. <laughs> Some of them with funny names like Isico Zephyus, so <laughs> Zephyus like the big waves, and Isico like the museum. Um, so yeah, there, there is a lot of fossils that come from Africa and uh, to the point that in 2019 uh, my colleague uh, Lambert from Belgium uh, managed to recre re uh, how, not recreate but redraw the migration route from the, the cradle of evolution of whales which is in Pakistan through Africa and all the way to America so the first dispersal route of whales across continents that occurred some, uh, as you can see the dates here, <coughs> some 40 million years ago. So when I did my PhD, we found some fossils that were 48 million years ago. We could not think that it could be waves because at that time we did not know there were so many. So since 2013, that was my uh, PhD thesis, they, they've discovered enough fossils to now recreate a complete migration route that goes through the African continent. So, so there's a lot of very, very nice fossils. Uh, and we can also recreate, uh, redraw the migration routes of whales by using their, their uh, parasites. <laughs> so the, those barnacles that are attached to the whales, they also fossilize. And when we find their fossils, we know whales were there. And so they, um, they, rec they manage to recreate the, those migration routes, which are very similar to the modern migration routes, just using the fossil record of those barnacles. And, uh, and they manage also to discover a new, well, an old migration route that doesn't exist anymore through the Mediterranean Sea, because they find those barnacles also in the Mediterranean Sea. So, and in South Africa, just for indication, the, the oldest barnacles are 164,000 years, which is pretty young for us paleontologists. This is not even a million years old. But uh, my colleague here, uh, Romala Govender, found fossil waves um, in the Langebanwerk, which is the, the West, Coast, West Coast Fossil Park, uh, that are 5 million years old. So the oldest ancestor of humpback whales, the, the ones we are celebrating today, uh, are, from, uh, are about 5 million years old in South Africa. So 5 million years old, just to give you an indication in terms of human evolution, Five million years old, we are before Australopithecus. So just to give you an idea of where humans were at that time, <laughs> it's before Australopithecus, so it's even before the man-ape. And today we are going to answer that question. So we, I, I showed you the, the question of migration routes that we can reconstruct using the fossil record. Uh, another question that is very interesting to tackle with the fossil record uh, is where do whales come from? So when you ask yourself where do marine species come from, some of them it's easy. Like uh, the seals, for example, seals it's pretty easy to know that they are just dogs that swim. Uh, so you know their ancestors were dog-like. 
penguins, same thing. It's pretty easy to see that penguins are birds that swim. So you know their ancestors were not swimming, but they were uh, marine birds that were capable of flying, but then lose the ability to fly and become penguins. But what about whales? So by the way, this is a very nice picture. Thank you, Lloyd. <laughs> <laughs> no, but what about whales and dolphins? They, they look like nothing else. They are pretty unique. Uh, nothing in their biology really gives up uh, in their current biology, I mean, really gives up what they are uh, descended from. There are some clues uh, when you look at their anatomy and their biology. So, for example, uh, they milk their babies. Uh, they, they can grow hair. So this is a so this is a mutation. This is not the regular condition of the bottlenose dolphins. Those tiny hairs on the face. <coughs> um, this is a mutation, a rare mutation, but sometimes it happens and the, the hairs grow on the face and so there some dolphins have whiskers. Uh, there is also the, 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 the Ganges dolphin in India that also has whiskers on its face. And when you dissect the, the, tiny, the, the big knobs that the humpback whales have on their face, you also find a hair follicule. So whales can sometimes display hairs. Uh, and uh, they have lungs. So lungs, if you think about it, it's pretty much the worst thing you want to have when you swim. <laughs> you prefer gills. You prefer to be a fish and have gills. But whales have lungs. Why? Because they are descended from a terrestrial species that milked his baby and had hairs, a mammal. <coughs> so we know that they are marine mammals because of that. But that's pretty much as far as we can go using the morphology. We cannot make up exactly where they come from just with that. Uh, also, an interesting fact is that they have, uh, particularly the right whales, have a remnant of a pelvis with a femur. So they have the, the, the remnant of a limb that is always present, particularly developed in males. Um, and sometimes you have also mutant dolphins that develop relictual uh, back legs. So all of this gives, off, gives up the, the fact that they are descended from a terrestrial species. So now the big question is what kind of terrestrial whale was that? <laughs> so we are looking, today we are going to look at what is that walking ancestor of whales. And uh, we already know it's a mammal, but what kind of mammal? There are about 5,000 species of mammals. We want to know which ones, which family uh, gave birth to the whales. So DNA is a very great help. Uh, in, when you analyze the DNA of whales, you can compare it to the other species of modern mammals. You can't do that with fossils, of course, and there's no DNA in fossils, but you can do that with modern species of mammals. And when you compare the DNA of whales to the DNA of other uh, species of mammals, you find that they are actually related to the family called the Artiodactyl. So the, it's the family where you find camels, pigs, uh, so ruminants, it would be your giraffes, antelopes, uh, cows, sheep, etc. The hippos, and you can see that family tree at the top of that family tree there are your whales. So whales are related to those herbivorous and quadrupedal species according to DNA. That's, um, that, was a, that's, that came as a surprise in the, 19, in the 1990s uh, when we first looked at the genomes of whales. And this was all the more surprising that at that time, same thing, we did not have so many fossils documenting the evolution of whales. So everything that I'm going to show you today is pretty much a development from the last 30 years. Yes. So it's only from 1990 that that was worked out? Yes. Wow. So they could look at some tiny sequence of DNA and some tiny sequence of proteins before, uh, but these were not looked very seriously because the sequences were too short. So the, that came out strongly only in the 1990s. Well, that came out as an evidence. <laughs> Before that, it was extremely debated. Uh, so now, what, what we're going to do is we're going to travel from present day and back in time to find the route, the evolutionary route of whales, and try to understand how 
something that was quadrupedal and herbivorous turned into animals that are now that can be now gigantic, are completely aquatic, and have a completely different diet, mostly animal-based, uh, animal-based protein. So today we have two big families of whales: uh, <coughs> the baleen whales and the echolocating whales or toothed whales. So uh, mysticity for the baleen whales, odontoceti for the toothed whales, and they are very well. It's very easy to, to differentiate them. So the, the echolocating whales have that knob on their face that they use to produce ultrasound that they use for like a sonar to, to locate their prey. They create a picture from sound, but I'm sure you're already very familiar with that. Um, and they are also distinct from the, the mysticity because they are teeth. They, they, they still have teeth, most of them, not the big whales. Uh, but um, as opposed to the big whales, big, uh, the mysticity, the baleen whales, baleen whales don't have teeth, and instead they have uh, those those baleens, which are like hairs that grow on the palate. <coughs> so they are not trans teeth that were transformed into uh, long, thin, uh, thin stuff, fluffy stuff. These are completely different from teeth. The teeth are lost, and on the palate, they grow hairs that they use to skim the, the food out of the water. So, and the mysticets are the ones that grow, that usually grow gigantic size. On the toothed whale size, you, you have mostly medium sized species, except the, the, the sperm whale. And as I said earlier, nothing in their morphology indicates any possible ancestry among other species of mammals. So we are going to look particularly at three characters, three features that will connect our, whale, our modern whales to their common ancestor with Arceodactyls. Uh, but for now, in modern day whales, you don't have any of those three characters. So we go back. 30 million years ago. Now we travel back in time. 30 million years ago, you still had odontoceti and mysticeti, but they looked very different from what they look today. <laughs> so first, the mysticeti were pretty small. Uh, this is a skull from Aetiocetus, uh, one that I saw in San Diego. The skull is about that size, so it's relatively small uh, as far as baleen whales go. Um, and you can see Aetiocetus is a very fun... Um, uh, baleen whale because it has teeth. So that one has, still has its ancestral teeth. And the teeth here, that's a, that's a, a close-up view of that part of the maxilla. You can see these teeth are not alone. They are accompanied on the palate by these uh, furrows uh, in red. These furrows are, the, the, are for the vessels and the nerves that innervate and supply the, the baleens. So that animal had both baleens and teeth. It had both of the organs. So it's a perfect intermediate between the primitive condition with only teeth and the derived condition with only the baleens. And on the other hand, here you have Echovenator, a 30 million years old uh, toothed whale. And Echovenator, so we know Echovenator is a toothed whale first because it has the teeth, of course. But it's also echolocating because we could look at the inner ear using a CT scanner, so X-rays. We could look at the inner ear, and the inner ear is very big, with a very deep um, uh, furrow going through the, the the cochlea that indicates it could be it could hear ultrasound. So it was capable of hearing ultrasound, and it has this uh, kind of depression in the skull, that shallow depression to accommodate uh, the melon, which is the amplifier for the ultrasounds that, the, that whales use to create those ultrasounds. So it has everything, so you can see here, it's drawn here. So you, it has the, the, the organ to create the ultrasounds and the organ to catch the ultrasounds. So it was definitely an echolocating whale. Um, and what's interesting with that guy is also the teeth. When you look at the teeth, 
you look at the teeth, and I'm putting this here, the teeth of Echovenator, they are triangular with those denticles on the side, like a meat knife. Uh, these are very complex teeth for whales. Modern dolphins have very simple teeth, just one cusp, and that's it, like fish. Uh, but this guy has those big triangular teeth, and that's the first character we're going to follow all the way through the evolution of whales. Uh, this is a very important character, because when you look at Misty Seti from the, from, uh, that lived also 40 million years ago, like Coronadon, for example, you see the same triangular and denticulated teeth. So, so that is the first character that connects Odontoceti, Misty City, and their common ancestor. And now if we travel, oh, and yeah, um, and this is a baby, uh, uh, the Ambry, well, uh, a late fetus of a modern whale, and you can see they cut into the maxilla, and they can see the tooth sockets in that, uh, in that fetus. So modern whales, like their ancestors, like they recapitulate their evolution when they grow. They, first they have teeth, then they lose them, then they grow the balins, and that's exactly what's happened also in the, across their evolution. They first have teeth, then they grow balins and they lose their teeth. So now let's trace that character back in time. We go back again 10 million years uh, before, from, uh, before that time, 40 million years ago. Now there's no more Odontoceti and Mysticeti. There's only their common ancestor, and their common ancestor belongs to a group called the Archaeoceti, so the old whales. And these Archaeocetes, so the, 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 the best known example of Archaeocetes that we know today is Basilosaurus, Basilosaurus from uh, Egypt. So that's the most common whale that you find in that valley of whales that I told you about. And Basilosaurus, you can see, look more or less like a modern whale. Uh, it has a long and streamlined body. When you look at the tail, uh, the, the vertebrae are rounded, which means that it had a fluke that was articulating like this. So it was definitely an animal that was swimming, except that it has this at the back, and this is a femur, tibia and fibula, and a foot. And they are definitely very well developed and, uh, and easily recognizable. You, even, you can even see the wrist articulation there. So this, fit, this foot was not functional, it could not work on land, but this strongly indicates that archaeocytes were four-legged whales. And we will even travel even further back in time and see that some of them had very well developed legs, actually. So I'm adding that character here, the, that feature, the fact that they are foot on, the, on our time travel uh, map, if I may call it a map. Um, and when you look at the skull of uh, Basilosaurus, you see that Basilosaurus also has those big triangular and serrated teeth. So that character was definitely inherited in modern, uh, in, uh, in those whales that we see 40 million years ago. So Basilosaurus is the best picture we have of the ancestor of whales. And when you look also at the, another interesting feature of, the, of its skull is the position of the nostrils. So the nostrils are not at the top of the skull, like in any other mammal. It's not. Uh, on, the, on the roof of the skull, in the blowhole position like in whales, it's intermediate. It's, it has started its mig migration backward, but it's just uh, at the, on midway, I may say. And we have a lot of those uh, archaeocity in Africa. So for example, this is Egyptocetus from Egypt, uh, as its name indicates. Uh, this is Togocetus from Togo and Senegal. Uh, this is a piece of the maxilla uh, with those big teeth, and you can see those big triangular teeth, very characteristic of our fossil whales. This is Carolina Cetus from Senegal, and you can see the beautiful reconstruction. That's, a, that's a, an animal that looks more like a seal now than it looks like a whale. So Carolina Cetus is a bit more primitive than Basilosaurus. It has bigger hind limbs, and you can see the fluke also is not that well developed. 
But it is definitely related to waves because of those big triangular teeth. And one of my favorite fossils of the, the evolutionary series of whales is Myacetus. So Myacetus means the mother whale. Uh, it's uh, 40 million years old. It comes from Pakistan. And uh, you can see, so that's the fossil. That's the interpretive drawing of the fossil. And that area in blue is the baby of Myacetus. And you can see the baby, the, those orange-brown dots, these are the teeth. So the skeleton is that side, the head is that side. So the baby uh, died in the, in the birth tract of the mother, uh, and the mother probably also died in, uh, at the same moment. But that indicates that these whales, these archaeocyte whales, were giving birth head first, not tail first like modern whales do. So this is an adaptation to life in water. You are born tail first so that you can swim straight to the surface to take your first gulp of hair. Of air, sorry, not hair. <laughs> <laughs> so French people put the H at a bit randomly. <laughs> so, um, but when you, when you are still adapted to life on land, you give birth with the head first so that your first gulp of hair is when you come out, uh, is, is directly when you come out. So, so this indicates that those archaeocytes with those big developed eye limbs uh, were giving birth on land. So they would actively come out of the water, give birth on land, just like, uh, just like uh, um, sea lions do, for example. So now, our last the last step in our journey through whale evolution will be 50 million years ago. We are definitely back to the very ancestry of whales, we are finally going to see what that ancestor, that walking whale, looked like. And it definitely did not look like a walking whale. Uh, this is the skeleton of the animal, this is the skull, so it's an animal about that size, so the size of a diker. Uh, you can see it has four well-developed legs with well-distinct uh, digits on their, on their legs. It's called Indoeus, and it's from Pakistan. And so Indoeus has four legs, for that connects it to the 40 million years whales. When you look at the teeth of Indoeus, you can see the premolars are quite triangular. They are not very easy to see here, but this is a magnification of a close relative of Indoeus called Sibocarus. And you can see those teeth are definitely the same shape as they are in more derived whales that we've seen earlier. So it also connects to the, to the evolution of whales through its teeth. And now the most important character so, is the auditory bulla. So the auditory bulla is the, it's, uh, the resonating chamber that you have attached to your inner ear. And that resonating chamber is a very important feature when you are a marine species. It has to be very thick and very dense if you want to iso isolate your ear and be able to locate sound when you, when you are a mammal adapted to life in water. Uh, most mammals have either a weakly ossified auditory bulla or no ossified auditory bulla at all. Especially at, at that time, for 50 million years ago, most mammals did not have an auditory bulla at all. So finding that auditory bulla here in Indoeus is already quite exceptional. But to see that this auditory bulla is very thick and very dense and looks like a bowl, like in modern whales, that was a big surprise. So you see the auditory bulla here, very big, very thick, very dense. Here, yeah, same, same thing, very big, thick and dense. And in Indoeus, you have the same feature. So Indoeus was definitely capable of hearing underwater, and it was strongly adapted to hearing underwater. It was not just your, your semi-aquatic animal. It was really an animal that had display adaptations to spend a great amount of time underwater. Uh, and when you look at the limbs also, and you make sections to the limbs, you can see that the limbs are thickening. So they act as ballasts so that the animal could stay down in the water for a long time. So in the use, 
is connected to the evolution of waves through that color, that feature, the, the thick and uh, adapted, the thick uh, auditory bulla adapted to here underwater. Now, what puts in the use apart is its dentition. Its dentition is, is uh, made of square molars. So the three molars are triangular, but the molars are square, and that indicates it's an herbivore, unlike modern waves. And this the fact that it's an herbivore now makes you think about the arthrodactyls, the antelopes and the giraffes and the hippos that we talked at the beginning. So that links it to the arthrodactyls. And here we look at the ankle of Indoeus, the ankle bone of Indoeus. Unlike a regular ankle that's, that is articulated to the leg only, the ankle of an Indoeus is articulated to the leg and to the foot. So there is a double articulation that increases the, the, the movement arm of the foot. It's an adaptation for running that was inherited from its antelope-like ancestors. And here, that's a reconstruction of Indoeus. It's reconstructed as a diker-like animal, so with antelope-like legs, uh, a body that looks very much like a diker, but it lived underwater. So Indoeus is really the missing link we were looking for in the beginning. So when we look at this evolutionary tree, you have those animals that are definitely herbivorous and terrestrial. You have these animals that are definitely aquatic and carnivore, or um, animal protein based diet. And here you have Indoeus at the base of their tree, an animal that is herbivorous, but spends a significant amount of time underwater and display the same adaptations as, uh, as modern waves. And then those other characters, now we've seen how they have been lost through the evolution of whales, so the, how the feet were lost, how the specific triangular dentition was also lost, up to the point that almost nothing today indicates that whales are descended from an animal that looked like this. Um, and this was all indicated by, uh, I've exemplified this with uh, Basilosaurus from Egypt and all those whales that we've seen in Togo and Senegal. So now maybe it makes little sense for you to imagine that whales are descended from an herbivorous animal, but when you look at the behavior of modern herbivores, you easily find herbivores that are semi-aquatic, like the hippos. This is Iemoscus, it's the African moose deer. And, it, and it, uh, it has that behavior that it hides underwater uh, to escape from predators. So it's, and it's very similar, as you can see, to Indoeus, except it has a short tail and it's still alive. <laughs> <laughs> That's a significant difference. <laughs> um, and when you look at giraffes or deers, today, uh, yeah, deers, you see sometimes <coughs> hints of carnivory in those animals. So the giraffes can the, you know they have to munch on bones to get their calcium phosphate, but as you can see, sometimes there's a bit of meat on those bones, and they, they don't reject them. Uh, the cows uh, also, cows uh, are not against eating the, the eggs of birds that are uh, laying their eggs uh, on ground when they find them. Uh, and here you have a deer, which in the arch winter uh, in uh, the northern hemisphere, also is not against eating some meat uh, when there's only that available. So, so it's not so weird to see a uh, herbivore turn into an aquatic animal or a carnivore and, in, and for whales it's both of them. So that story I gave you of course as I said is the African per perspective on it but uh, this is a short video that summarizes that story and this is the, the, the point of view that you will find in textbooks and documentaries with the series going from Pachycetus, Ambulocetus, etc. So if you want to know more about that story, you can always email me, email me at this address and I will gladly answer your question if you want to know more, if you want papers or videos and stuff. Um, I will gladly answer. Thank you very much. Thank you.